Hey everybody, uh, my name is Mike McGee and I'm a director and actor based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And my friend Lauren who runs RDU on stage uh, has been uh, pumping the airways with uh, content during the pandemic to keep the theater community engaged, interviewing local theater people, Broadway folks. And I've tackled the West End interviews because I go to London a lot for my day job. So uh, I'm super excited today to talk to another West End star, singer, songwriter, playwright, uh, Aaron Blair Mangit. I hope I didn't but I hope I didn't butcher your last name. Perfection. Perfection. <laughs> thank you. So how are you? I'm doing really well actually, thank you. How are you? I, I am uh, hanging in there. Yeah, I uh, it's a crazy time. It's a crazy time. I, I'm I'm safe. I'm well. I have a day job that pays my bills. So I, I everything in the world could be uh, could be worse. But my theater job, my theater world is a little bit up in the air right now. I'm, I uh, I, ca I cast a show on Zoom on uh, video submissions and we started rehearsing. Now we're trying to decide if we can do it or not. So uh, wow. we'll see. Yeah. So What's but the anyway. Situation like on the ground in NC. Uh, so it's it's uh loosening up a little bit i actually if you notice got a haircut uh for the nice. first time in like three months so uh we can uh we can now dine in restaurants with some restrictions and stuff like that but uh mm -hmm. um i i think um if you look at the cases though we're still have a lot of cases a lot of people in the hospital a lot of people dying so it's it's still tough here um certainly we haven't experienced what uh what new york city experienced but uh but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's. I think there's a lot of we're we're one of those states that is not to get into super politics, but we're we're what they call a purple state, which is yeah. kind of half Republican, half Democrat. Yeah. So our governor is is Democratic, but the the assembly is Republican. So there's a lot of pressure on him to start opening things, and he's trying to be mm -hmm. conservative. So it's it's uh, it's a little bit uh, wonky right now. How about you? So I usually just to set the stage, I usually start with a few pandemic questions because it's hard to avoid. And then let's go on to some fun stuff and uh, sure. and, and enjoy ourselves. Sure. So the number one question is, how are you? Are you healthy? Where are you locked down? How is how is the lockdown going for you? Thank you for asking. I am healthy. Luckily, me and my family, we're healthy. We are well. We're just navigating through this uncharted terrain as best as we can, checking in with our loved ones. My closest uh, cousins actually live in New Jersey, New York. So we're oh. talking to them pretty much that's, weekly. That's where uh, I'm from. Yeah. Oh, oh lovely. Yeah. Yeah. One of my brothers lives in LA. So. Um, we talk almost every day, yeah. but yeah. I'm at home with the family in North London. I'm very grateful for this time and this stillness with them. I'm trying to find the silver lining because ultimately <laughs> there's so much madness and uncertainty that if I can find a positive on a daily basis, that's kind of what helps me get through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very bizarre. I think some of the recent happenings as well have definitely interrupted my kind of positive sentiment of positive yeah. energy, but we do as best as we can. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, one of the sessions Lauren uh, hosted early on was with a social a friend of ours who's a social worker uh, talking about grief and loss from a theater community perspective, because, right, I mean, sure, there, there are things much worse than what we are experiencing. I mean, I, you know, theater is a, a second job for me. For you, it's your, your living, right? But so it's okay to grieve. It's okay to grieve those kind of things. It's okay to Absolutely. feel loss and, and pain. So uh, and also I think it's also important for people to navigate their way through this, however it fits on them and however they see Absolutely. Fit for them, that makes sense. Like ultimately, the world is going through this epic pandemic, and it's now it's trying to figure out what the new normal will look like. But you're allowed to, like you said, mourn and grieve almost life as we knew it, and the theatre world as we knew it, because we're going to have to build up from the top. But I'm very positive that the phoenix will rise. I feel really, really um, excited about what the future may hold. It's going to bring the community closer together, and it's also revealing the severity or the lack thereof of kind of help from i can speak from the british government how we're kind of left flailing so we're definitely holding each other tighter as best as we can it's a lot it's a lot yeah it's a lot, it's a lot to take on Yeah, no, i i, I always uh, again I, I i go to uk probably um well not anymore right now but uh before that probably once every four or five weeks so i'm i'm really over the last oh, three wow. or four years so yeah yeah so I'm very, visitor. Okay. i am so but i i our countries are very similar right now honestly i mean with the current leadership at the top of both our our governments i think we both had uh a lack of preparedness and a lack of uh direction from our our leadership and uh yeah, it's uh, it sucks <laughs> for lack of a better term. I mean, it, a lot of people have been left on their own. A lot of my theater people that do it for a living are hurting, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Um, I so what have you been doing creatively to stay healthy and uh, physically to stay healthy? Well, I feel like for me, I love being busy. So at first, I was quite resistant to this new 
routine or maybe lack of routine. So I was like, Mila, let me do all the things and say yes to everything and be super busy. And over the course of the past two months, two and a half months, I've kind of been easing up on that. But most of my time has been spent writing because okay. that's very in my control. And that's something you can do when you're by yourself. And that's been super liberating. I've kind of been escaping in this made up world and <laughs> living vicariously through my characters on the page. Um, so that, hey Kelly, yes, come fly over. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like writing's been my saving grace. I've also been kind of trying to illuminate the community, the musical theatre community in particular. I mean, I don't really like to use labels, like I just think we're all actors, but for the purpose of how the industry is in this country more so than in America, I think there's a lot more fluidity. Uh, I have created a platform called The Musical Alphabet, which basically uplifts the theatre community, hopefully, and theatre fans by pr producing and providing videos of some of their favourite West End stars or theatre performers around the world, actually, singing some songs. So every week we do a different letter and then a musical beginning with that letter, you sing a song from it, so forth, so on. So that's one thing, I sing like little bedroom ballads most days to put out for people for a little bit of positivity. Yeah. And yeah, writing mostly, writing mostly. Yeah. And out. There's like an exercise bike in the corner of this room. So that's like my saving grace. How about you? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, well, I, before I, I will tell you, but <laughs> before I, um, I didn't realize the musical after I've been watching those videos. Those are amazing. So uh, I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize they were yours. I saw the, I saw the rent one that you, you did recently, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I've seen some other ones and didn't realize you created that. Um, yeah, so this is one of the, so I, I, I did have some, I had three shows I was directing this year. One is definitely pushed off into 2021. Uh, one uh, we did cast with the hope of maybe getting it up and we're gonna, we pushed it to September, we'll see, but I, we started rehearsing a little bit on Zoom. Um, but yeah, I started these interviews. My friend Lauren, I saw how this came about. I'm talking too much about myself. Well, I want to get back to you, but uh, I, I'm uh, I'm friends with Maya Kwanza Breed, and we did a little private event where we raised. Yeah, she's amazing. Love her. Uh, I so I heard. We're going to talk about that in a second. I heard you sing the par part in the uh, six uh, video. Yeah. Had to represent for her. <laughs> yeah. So so we did a little private event a little early on on Zoom, a little concert to help raise some money for her and and another cause and. I interviewed her and my friend Lauren uh, covered it, who runs this site, covered it to write about it. And then she asked me if I wanted to start doing some interviews. So that's what I've been doing. This is my seventh interview and plus May is about lucky with the eight. Seven. Yeah, lucky number seven. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this. This has been my main creative outlet. It gives me a week to kind of prepare questions, look at research and, uh, and then do these. And they've been super well received and fun. And um, fitness wise, I, I, I have, uh, been walking every day uh, about four or five miles and uh, I have a couple pets so I take my dogs for walks and stuff like that yeah so you got to do what you got to do so I was on a panel last night of directors talking about directing so it's just whatever we can do to to find uh, creativity in this world mm -hmm. are you uh, I usually ask about tv are you binging anything are you a Netflix person uh, yeah I'm quite lucky in the sense of I I've always kind of had Netflix I've got Amazon Prime yeah. I think we have Apple in this household and Apple has, Apple so has we've got good... a plethora of options yeah. but what I'm really enjoying is like the Mexican Netflix shows uh, and the oh. Spanish Netflix shows because I speak but I really want to get my vocabulary a lot wider and have okay a wide a, a better grasp on the language so I'm watching all of those in Spanish and that's it's kind of educational as well as entertainment which is nice so yeah, Mighty awesome. Heist, Casa de las Flores, um, Control Z, I have been watching those primarily. Call My Age is probably not my favorite show. It's a French show. Oh, wow. Apple. But yeah, I, I like to, I don't want to ever, I always have to watch something that is either shot stunningly, acted beautifully. There has to be one element that I'm hooked on. I can't really binge something just for the sake of watching something because I'd rather just write or, or watch a movie or okay. talk to some friends. But they're probably like the primarily the ones that I'm kind of into. How about you? So no Tiger King, no Tiger King. Or... I've not seen Tiger King. I'm really <laughs> I've never seen, um, what's the one about cats? Something, oh, Don't F with Cats. Like, oh, I'm yeah, I've not yeah, seen yeah. any, I've not seen yeah, Making yeah. a Murderer. Yeah, yeah. Basically, if everyone's talking about it, I won't have seen it. <laughs> I'm, I'm like several steps behind, but sometimes on my head as well, like in other, other avenues, I'll, I'll be like watching French shows or, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I've been binging a lot of stuff. I, I started out with, um, I think a lack of motivation. So I, I just didn't feel like doing anything. And so I watched a lot of TV and Netflix and I've been slowly coming out of that and getting more involved in things again and doing some other stuff. But, uh, uh, and then my show started. So I had to start blocking that and getting into that. So, but yeah, it's, it was, uh, it was just, Can I know. ask what show it is or is it top secret? Yeah. Oh no, it's a, it's a show called Lobby Hero. It's by uh, Kenneth Lonergan. 
um, who wrote Manchester by the Sea. You may know that movie and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It was done uh, two or three years. It, this is just a regional production, but it was done uh, two or three no, years ago. <laughs> Fair. It's a fantastic uh, regional production. Uh, absolutely. Your country uh, is huge. You can't, you can't <laughs> that's true, avoid that's fair. regional amazing show to Broadway. It's all relative. That's so, fair. It was, it was done on Broadway a few years ago with uh, Chris Evans, Captain America, played one of the characters. Michael Sarah played another one. Uh, Beth Powley, who's a uh, British actress, uh, was one of the characters in it. It's a four-person show, so it's a small show. Uh, timely, because it hits on racism, sexism. Um, for the, three of the characters are white. Uh, one of the characters is black and has to make it, his brother has asked him to be uh, an alibi for him. He's accused of, of murdering a white woman. Wow. And uh, this guy has worked his way up, has a great career now, and is trying to decide whether he, he, he wasn't with his brother. So he's trying to decide whether to trust his brother and be his alibi or, or not. And, and the, the young female cop is having an affair with the older cop. So everyone has just this little, their own little problems and their own little lies that would that get worked, worked out over two, two nights in the lobby of a Manhattan uh, nice. uh, apart, apartment building. Yeah. Sounds yeah. intense, but also like the perfect recipe for a play. Yeah, it, it, it's, 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 I happened to see it, which is why I brought it forward to this theater to produce. And uh, it, it was amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. How many amazing. times have you worked with this theatre in association or collaboration with them? Uh, this is my fifth show I'm directing for them. Nice. Yeah, so it's been a few years. I, I started out uh, more in stage management and acting and then morphed <laughs> into directing about three or four years ago. And so I uh, I also direct a huge panto uh, of Cinderella for this other theater. That's uh, you guys have panto over there. That's nice. So uh, we don't traditionally, uh, but the theater uh, uh, that I work with that I uh, is uh, the, one of the largest. Uh, theaters and well, community theaters in the country. It's been running almost 90 years now. And uh, the director there 36 years ago, 37 years ago, uh, the artistic director started this show. Uh, he was a Panto fan and started a, a Cinderella Panto. And they've been running it every year for 37 years. It's changed a lot though over the years, but I, I would be directing it. My, I'll be directing it hopefully for my third year. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, it's a big show. That's going to be a tough one because it's a big show. It's like twenty-eight people, cast-wise and well, orchestra. The four, the four hand up, so that's possible. Cool. That's you that's could do that socially distance. Yeah, absolutely. To the stage. Absolutely. Uh, so tell me a little bit about. I want to get into your your shows, but I just touch on Anne Juliet for a minute. Anne Juliet was running uh, when this shutdown happened, and you you guys actually had a little bit of a health crisis yourselves as a company right before. So tell me a little bit about that. Like, yeah, I had to do a concert version, and uh... um, I actually don't know too much about it because it hit our dress my dressing room really hard. Oh, but, okay. Uh, we were all feeling really poorly the week before the government advised people to not go to the theater or restaurants yeah. or cafes or anywhere. That basically is hospitality and same industry. But uh, yeah, so on the Monday, some of the cast members were feeling sick, and then we started dropping like flies. Excuse me. <laughs> and by the Thursday, I was too poorly to perform. So. My understudy did the matinee, I think, but then he became really poorly, and then the second May was not in the country, so they had no no, no May for a few. There's shows. no more May, so yeah. Is that when they no broke May. down and did the concert the concert version at that point? Yeah, I think so. But um, I was bed bound, so it kind of yeah. Went <laughs> into. But you know, I hear it was fantastic. I hear yeah. It was um, you know, obviously the audience got to experience something that hopefully will never have to happen again. But you yeah. know, so one night only or three night only moment but uh yeah <laughs> my my first interview was with grace mowett so uh who i know a little bit yeah amazing grace and she was out also and and she's she's very bummed she missed the uh the concert version <laughs> she's <laughs> been watching so hard like she's fantastic and have you seen her in the role uh no so i saw the show twice um and um, unfortunately, both, I mean, not unfortunately, it was great to see her, but uh, I, I have not yet got to see her as Juliet. No, I've seen her in her ensemble role uh, oh, both times. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So let's, nice. let's see, let's put that for a side a second. I want to get to in Juliet because I have lots of conversations on that. And let's get off the pandemic if that's all right for you. Let's move on to some more, uh, some more fun stuff. Great. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. I have to ask you because I ask everybody your favorite pandemic snack, your favorite quarantine snack right now. Right now, probably watermelon because it's warm in the Oh, and yeah. I like watermelon. Or mango. Oh, or I apples. love mango. Or dark chocolate. I'm obsessed with like I eat it every day. So probably those. I know I answered like four. Instead of four. That's okay. No, that's acceptable. We'll do a this and that at the end that you can't answer for it, but uh, <laughs> I won't allow it. <laughs> yeah, mangoes are one of my favorite. Uh, I will say this, the most shocking answer I've gotten so far is Jody Steele's was Twinkies. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. 
She better get it. I love that. I don't think I've had it. I don't think I've had a Twinkie in maybe a decade. She, but. she said she's she had never had one in her life. Uh, oh, and she okay. she's a care she's doing a care job right now and was able to go to a Costco and buy a box, big box of Twinkies and she ate them all the first night. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, sometimes that's the best way to consume it. Like open chocolate, it's not going to last more than twenty minutes. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So tell me a little bit. How did your How did you get into theater? Was this Was theater your something you started when you were a young child? How, tell me a little bit about how your journey. I guess in some started. ways, in a in a casual way, I used to go to a place called Chickasha Theatre Company, which is a space that celebrates inclusive theatre. So everybody is from different walks of life, different ethnicities, different abilities, more so than ever. Mm. So I learned sign language. I learned to communicate with people from different backgrounds with different uh, learning abilities. And that became my norm. So I joined that at six and that was like an after school theater club, I guess. And I stayed there until I was 18 and I would go a couple of times a week sometimes. And that was my entry. Cause I used to be shy, apparently. I have no recollection of this, but that helped me to come out of my shell. And then at 18, I was really lucky. I got signed to an agent cause I'd always been really proactive, like done things like National Youth Music Theater, Royal Academy of Dance. I'd go to like every week when I was 15, 16. And then when I finished five A levels, because I love school and I was a proper geek, um, <laughs> I signed to an agent and started working at eighteen. Really, so that's kind of my foray into the industry. And then I just kind of learned on the job. I did uh, go to drama school. Oh wow! I did go to university in tandem with working as an actor, which in hindsight was ludicrous, but at the time <laughs> I thought I could do. So I enrolled at the London School of Economics and did a history degree, um, which I'm really glad I did. It, provided a lot of context and it kind of satiated my curiosities and other avenues outside of performing that all have fed back into me as a writer, me as a person, me as a human, I guess. So yeah, that was kind of my introduction into the arts. So uh, is your background dancing, singing? What did, what did you train on most when you were younger or did you train on any of the specific disciplines? I would just like do it. I would just, <laughs> um, I would sing along to the music that my mom played in the car, whether that was Tony Braxton, Mariah Carey, Prince, MJ, um, a lot of classic R&B, but then some Bowie and yeah, uh, my dad has an amazing eclectic mix of music as well. And like you know, all his vinyls are behind me as well. So that I would just emulate what I could hear. And then in terms of dance, I did train in contemporary, um, and I would go like go to some clubs and I would try and just learn and copy and just <laughs> have control of my body. Like my technique's never going to be the best in terms of when you look at role ballet, I've not done a ballet class, but in my life, but I jumped to contemporary. I don't know why, but I loved it. I saw Sophie Gigan dance when I was like 13. I thought, I want to move like that. <laughs> it's long limbs. So that was kind of into dance. And with acting, I've always just been so fascinated by emotion and the expression of emotion or the, the lack of emotion sometimes. And for me, ultimately an actor is a vessel to emote or tap into a character where they are in the headspace and what they're feeling. And the older I get also, the more I realize that every actor I admire finds themselves in the character and kind of allows that to shine through. So as an actor, I'm constantly evolving and growing. Yeah. Um, in all of them I am, but I think acting is the one where I definitely see the growth the most. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. What, um, what's the first show you remember seeing as a kid? I know a lot of theater people can really, you know, put their finger on, I know I'm, I'm old, much older than you and I can still remember the first show I saw when I was a little one. The first, that's a great question. I do remember <laughs> going to see chicken shed shows to my brothers. I've got three brothers and two of them are older and they would be in the shows before I was okay. able to join. But the first like West End show I saw was Beauty and the Beast. I was uh -huh. seven, I think, or six, maybe seven. And it was at the Dominion. And I remember just, I think Disney was also like an entry into music because it was never like an aspiration of mine to, to, I didn't know it was a job to like be a musical <laughs> singing. But I also enjoyed like Disney musicals and yeah. cartoons. I, lo I still love cartoons. I love that anime as well. But, um, but yeah, Beauty and the Beast, being blown away by that was definitely, oh, this looks fun. Somebody else said that. I think it might have been Grace. Maybe not. Ah. Somebody, else during one of, somebody else during one of my interviews there first was that. I don't know if it was that same production, but Beauty and the Beast. My, my kids were obsessed with uh, Beauty and the Beast as well when they were younger. So uh, I, I saw the Broadway <laughs> production. I, I saw the Broadway production of Beauty and the Beast. I think, I don't think it was the original. Maybe it was the original. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> mine was Peter Pan when I was eight. So, nice. Uh, Where with, was that? Uh, with Sandy Duncan. It was on Broadway. Uh, I, I'm from New York, New Jersey area. So my uh, grandparents took me in to see that. And then, uh, and then didn't do a lot of theater in my life until uh, I went to a, it was a very sportsy area. 
and didn't even know you could do theater. And I uh, went to an all boys uh, religious high school and they didn't have theater, but we had a theater class that started my senior year. And he, God bless him, took 18 boys that probably weren't that interested to see uh, Into the Woods, which was the original nice. production of Into the Woods wow. with Bernadette Peters. And yeah, and that's when I got my, uh, I think my love of uh, theater. And then it took me a few years to actually start practicing and doing it. But uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. But I can Just vividly, uh, I have a, a young, much younger sister. Yeah. So I actually, crazy? Is she crazy? Um, not in theater. My, the way I got into theater was through my daughter. She actually started mm -hmm. doing theater. She started doing theater first and then I, followed in and uh just took off and then i've been doing it now for 15 years um nice. uh yeah so absolutely um so what um so you you so what was your first professional job come coming out of uh i would do some voiceover work when i was a kid like singing for the tweenies which is kind of like the telly tubbies and bits and bobs like that but my first theater like my theater debut was at 18. It was a tour of a new musical. We opened in Theatre Royal Stratford East, which is like very well, not, well known for doing new musicals in London. And then it went on a UK tour for like six months. It was called Britain's Got Bangra. Oh, so I saw I'm that half, on your, yeah. I'm half Punjabi, which not oh, a lot of people okay. necessarily know about me. And yeah, so that was kind of really wonderful for me because it was a half black, half Indian role. And that literally is my mix. So it was fantastic to kind of jump into those characters' shoes and live that experience knowing very much that it was so close to who I was as a person. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot, like being on the road, <laughs> going out my bubble of London and all the people I know. Yes, Emma's in the house, what, what? <laughs> He's also, she understands the experience of when you're like navigating all these cultures and communities within yourself, because I've got some Spanish in me, some Scottish in me, it's a real, real melting pot. And I'm very grateful for that, but growing up, when there's no one who looks like you or no one who really understands that experience. Yeah. I'm lucky I have three brothers and really supportive parents, but not everyone is afforded that experience. So with the very little platform I have within the theatre community of the London bubble, I'm aware of all the, the tiny, <laughs> tiny bubbles within that. I want to shout from the rooftops about how fantastic, fantastic it is to celebrate who you are. Um, hey, Kat and Sarah, Absolutely. celebrate ultimately what makes you unique because by being specific and exploring that identity, you're able to find like the universality, you know? A hundred percent agree with you, um, which leads to my next question. I do want to kind of journey through a few of your highlight shows, but I, I wanted to ask this up front to give it enough time and not rush it um, later. So looking at your, your CV and all the shows you've done, there's, there's, to me, there's a pattern there of shows that uh, tell a story of an under, underrepresented population, whether it be people of color, LGBTQ, uh, whatever, whatever it is, is that a conscious decision in shows you accept, or is that an, uh, a lucky uh, journey that your career took? Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, it's a great question. I think it's probably, if I'm honest, a synthesis of the two. I would never go in for an audition unless I'm passionate or curious about the project. So that, that's like the starting point. I'm not someone, some of my peers I admire, they just want to go for everything and they want to get the experience, meet the team. You never know what it could lead to. But for me, I'll read the script or I'll know of the project, say I've seen it, like I'd seen, I'd read Angels growing up and that was so pivotal for me. So as soon as I knew they were doing a revival, I was like, I must get seen. So I wrote to the casting team, they called me and I was very lucky because that was a very coveted job. But um, things like Kinky Boots, I guess was a curveball because I'd never, seen drag race at the time i'd never i always <laughs> british drag queens of that so being funny and and loud I'm, i mean i'm generalizing but there's a different kind of humor so when i knew king of was coming i'd never see the movie and i was like i don't think i'm at all right for this like what wow. i was like you should go i was like no nah, no nah, nah. but i thought you know what it's something that would take me on my comfort zone i've never worn heels i've never explored <laughs> my ex uh, identity or sexuality in that way on stage. So it'll be a laugh. And then ultimately it, it led to me booking the job and I got to work with some creatives who I admire and will have always admired, such as Jerry Mitchell, who's just an incredible mentor and friend. So for me, that was maybe like a surprise, but ultimately, yeah, most of the time I feel passionate about illuminating um, characters who have lived an experience, not necessarily that's close to mine, but is an experience that I want to see on the stage. Yeah, absolutely or done in a new, fresh, exciting way. That's what inspires me. That's uh, that's a great answer, thank you. Yeah, I just, I kept looking and I'm like, wait, you know, Hairspray, Kinky Woods, In the Heights, Angels in America, Leave to Remain. I mean, 
They're all telling me. Yes. Yes. I unfortunately didn't see that, but, uh, no um, uh, and I want to do want to talk about it in a minute. Um, but yeah, just amazing shows that tell amazing stories of, uh, of important populations that don't, uh, get represented a lot. Yeah. Um, one of the, I was on a director's panel last night and one of the questions was, um, you know, what in our community, what do we want to see more of? What types of shows do we want to see more of? And of course, more by women writers, more by, you know, people of color, oh, of course. But what I said is, you know, I want to just see shows that represent people that are in our lives, whether they be transgender people or, uh, which is one of the reasons I loved Anne Juliet so much or, uh, or people of color, whatever, you know, certainly telling stories about those people and their experiences are important, but also showing them in the context of the world that yeah. they live in, that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of everyday life is important Absolutely. as well. And, uh, so, yeah. So, and that's why a lot of the shows that you did, um, you know, I, I, I like I jump into Anne Juliet for a minute. I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a non-binary daughter, a child, sorry, see, that's hard for even me as a parent to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but just seeing that representation, but in a bigger story, I mean, the story, you guys have an amazing arc and an amazing storyline, but that's not what Anne Juliet is about, um, mm. solely. But isn't it's, it fantastic that it includes that? Oh, absolutely. being tokenized or like marginalized. It's so amazing. And I just tip my hat to the team for wanting to tell that story within the tapestry of all the characters and all of the kind of uh, storylines and arcs that they're already having to yeah. have May's trajectory and their journey, their love story. It's so cool. When I read this, I was like, this is amazing. Yes. Uh, amazing. So I'm glad that it spoke to you and resonated with you. Yeah, uh, amazingly. And I do want to talk, I have a bunch of, let's touch on a few other earlier shows and then we'll spend some time on Angelia if that's okay. Uh, in the Heights, you also did In the Heights, uh, which was a pretty, was that with Amy Atkinson and Genesis? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 So tell me a little bit about that experience. For sure. I mean, In the Heights was an amazing experience. In many ways, it might be my favorite job just because I, I met so many wonderful people and movers, shakers, players and makers on that job. Um, from the director, Luke Shepard, who then took me on for Anne Juliet, to uh, being reunited with one of my best friends, Jocasta Omgo, and then making friends with people like Jen and Amy, who I've taken on into my tribe. Um, <laughs> and then ultimately, I played opposite uh, a formidable, incredible actress called Gabriela Garcia, who has become my family. And it happened after Kinky Boots, and for me, it was kind of an interesting way to reset even my body language and physicality. So when you're wearing six inch heels for 13 months, you get used to carrying yourself in a certain way. Yeah. So I booked in the Heights while I was the Lola standby in August, 2016. Then I finished Kinky Boots. The last week I was playing Lola because Matt had holiday. I love Matt so much, Matt Henry, who originated it here. Um, I was also rehearsing for Benny and we only had eight days rehearsal to do the cast change. Oh wow. It was mental. <laughs> never done anything. I don't even know how, I don't even know how we made it work, but Alex Sarmiento, Jocasta, Armgill, Phil Cornwall rehearsed us in, and Michael Vivian rehearsed us in, they're the uh, associates in the team. In eight days, a new cast, or like half a new cast, and I would rehearse maybe 10 till four, then they'd break me. I'd run from <laughs> like Waterloo, across the bridge, grab some food, get into the dressing room, and then someone would paint my face while I was like eating my sushi. <laughs> and then I'd do a, sh did, did, would do a load of show, and I'm like, I was like 24, 25, I don't even know how I, maybe, maybe I was 24? Yeah, 24, um, and it was madness, actual madness. But <laughs> I loved it, and I would love to do that again. Not in the same way, but doubling up is like a beautiful, beautiful uh, blessing in, in a lot of ways as an actor. You, you don't realize it at the time, he's like, I'm tired, oh my God. I'm <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing, and yeah, in the Heights, I love Lee manuel Miranda's music so much. In a lot of ways, Heights, to me, just, encapsulates the sense of community and maybe the, oh my gosh, yeah. one of the best ways I've seen in musical theater. Eh, maybe ever, like maybe I'd put like Heights and Rent are kind of the, the very grounding, the musicals that grounds who I am maybe. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I, I love Hamilton, but In the Heights, I think it's my favorite of his. I love uh, Hamilton is genius. Yeah. Heights is like heart, Hamilton is. Yeah, heart. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to put it. Uh, how long were you in In the Heights? How long did that? Is so just... I did the last four months of the London run, so okay. September through January, and then I and then I booked Angels, which was crazy. So oh yeah, it was a you've, nice been, little... you've been you've been on a roll. Yeah, it's been good. <laughs> what? Uh... But, uh, we'll see. I don't know what's going to happen now, but um, yeah. Have you yeah. have you have you got to meet Lin Manuel before? Yeah, yeah. lovely, lovely. Lo I mean, 
such a gentle soul, like just chilling. He came through and was really complimentary. Um, it was. It's always important to me when you're playing lovers. Like I played Romeo back in 2014, and innately. I wanted to make sure that I would get on with the actress playing Juliet. We became really good friends, but because that ch chemistry transcends, so like I, I feel like I'm massively into seeing connections and seeing emotions in like this purest form. I don't really care. It's not that I don't care about technique, but if I'm going to see a play, I want to feel something. Or yeah, I'm yeah, just, of I want to feel something. So doing Romeo Juliet really sh taught me a lot about that interplay and that kind of dialogue that goes on set sometimes, just from a look or the way that you might touch them on stage. So when it got to heights and playing a lover again because it'd been a couple of years instantly i wanted to like get to know gabby get to know her her movement her energy her vibe so that i could play and bounce off that because if benny and nina have had this crush on each other for a long time and she's coming back from college and she's feeling deflated i need to inject her with that good good vibrancy and good loving if you know what i mean so um <laughs> i was really it was really important to me to make sure that came across and Hopefully it did, but it was also something that I just learned moving forward about how to like communicate with your fellow actors when you are mm. trying to do lovers on stage, but then also when you become like family off stage, which is a really weird thing. Did you enter? Did you two enter the show together as replacements, or was she in? No, she oh, okay. was in for a while. So it was that's also, hard. Like, yeah. rhythm and I loved it, and I think it kept it fresh for her because she was an original cast member. Oh wow! So she she'd done heights in 2014, 15, 16, and finished in 17. So she's an OG. Wow. That's but yeah, Lynn was lovely to de I deviate from your question. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. It was it was good. All good conversations. So yeah, well, I think we're up to Angels in America. Tell me, I mean, wow. What a, what a show to be a part of, huh? A beast. <laughs> yeah. Um, I still have, I don't know, it's, it's a weird one. Like, sometimes I think about it, I'm like, did that part of my life happen? Because I was an understudy on that show. Sure. But it was interesting for me because I've, I've swung, I've covered lots in musicals, but so then do it on a play where in a musical you go on all the time and if you're not on all the time you're sometimes on stage anyway okay. so it's going to be sat on the sidelines observing like a fly on the wall of all of these like masters at work like nathan lane and oh my like, gosh amazing oh. um so it was almost just like an extended i think i started in february march and finished in august september so like six seven months training just yeah. studying um i would love to revisit the play where am i <laughs> Like 20, in like seven years maybe okay that would be cool or maybe by then i don't know we'll see maybe uh, who knows but yeah but yeah definitely it's, it was an amazing piece and tony came and he was in the room and, and i love the we had two amazing associate directors harry and miranda who were just amazing and incredible and so good <laughs> their vision was so clear and they're both doing fantastically now their own things. Like Miranda co-directed Death of the Salesman with Marianne Elliott. Oh. And she's got her own theatre company. And she's really doing fantastic things. And then Harry is um, the AD at the Kiln Theatre in London. So they're, they're just amazing. Like, I got to meet some fantastic people. And that was also like an entry into the National Theatre, which led on to doing lots of readings and workshops with like Terrell, who wrote Moonlight, or uh, Polly Stenham. Um, so it was very cool. Very cool. I'm glad. Yeah, I no, There's cool. a lot of people like, why are you going to plan thing, Benny, to like... I'm just doing internationals like, because I want to follow passion projects rather than just work for the sake of working. Yeah. Did you get to go on? Did you get to go on at all? I didn't. I, in rehearsals, I was quite sure. lucky like, early on. I got to uh, rehearse with the company when uh, Nathan was out for, for a day or two. But no, in terms of the shows, because we never did an eight show week, which is also something I'm used to in terms of stamina. It was in rep with itself, so like they'd do part one, part two, maybe have a day off, part one, part two. So it was always time for them to recuperate, and they were fantastic. It was amazing. So yeah. Now I can't. Yeah, were you, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. There's a You're delay. Fine, I'm uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, were you in both parts? I, I, I didn't remember which character you played. Are you, was your character yeah, yeah, in both yeah. parts? Okay. Everyone, everyone is. Ultimate. Yeah, that's what I thought. It okay. just fluctuates a little bit. So what, I mean, as an understudy, it's what a six hour piece total, something like that, uh, seven yeah, hours? Seven. seven. So what? Yeah. How how could you prepare yourself without getting a lot of stage time to step into a seven hour piece? I mean, did you feel did you feel prepared, or were you panicked every day that you might have to go on? I was mostly prepared. I think the musical theatre background helped in that. But two of our understudies out of I think seven actually went on, and they were okay. fantastic. Because okay. we'd run lines backstage, we would yeah. do work out, we would test each other, we would run the play backstage in tandem with them doing it on stage. Um, and if I wasn't doing that, I was writing, I was working on. Play on my own play on my own musical so i was always trying to be productive with the time and it did ultimately fly by yeah 
Yeah. Amazing. Um, and so uh, is Nathan Lane and Andrew Garfield amazing to work with as it seems? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew's amazing. Like, uh, I'm saying amazing a lot, but he is. But that's okay. And the day I did actually rehearse with him, I had quite a bit with him and he just was really generous and really sweet. He's just, I love actors who listen and that's what he does really well. Um, and Nathan's amazing. Oh my goodness, a genius. Wow, his comedic, comedic timing. He just was so prepared. I don't think I've seen an actor just turn up and just be like, boom! Oh, wow. So well. Like, it's almost like he just, he needed like the gentle nudge where uh, often the director will like direct. He just did not really need it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I directed an actor like that. Uh, he, he was, you know, much more senior than me and uh, just, knew, just knew what to do. So I would occasionally give him a little bit of a push in a direction, but I'm like, what am I gonna tell this guy that he hasn't already mm -hmm. figured out on his own? Um, tell me a little bit about, before we go on Anne Juliet, uh, there's so much to talk to you about. Uh, tell me a little bit about Leave to Remain. I, that seemed really interesting when I was doing a little research uh, on it. Yeah, um, shout out to Don who's just come in. Yes, <laughs> Dominic, amazing illustrator, check him out. Um, Leave to Remain also just kind of happened quite last minute. Well, I don't even remember what I was doing at the time. I think I, when was it? 2018, 19? Yeah, I think I maybe finished Angels and I was doing some workshops and um, Matt Jones is a fantastic television writer. Kelly from the Block Party kind of created this really interesting, unusual take on a queer love story kind of through the lens of immigration. And I read the script and thought, oh, this is cool because it's quite, quite episodic. It feels quite TV, but it's also musical. This has not really been done before. So I just auditioned on a whim and had some fun with it and really connected um, with the creative team. And lo and behold, that led to another job. And for me, it was nice because the character I played was quite devious and <laughs> often kind of the sweet friend or like the lover, which is great. But like to be able to go into that mindset because we love that kind of like naughty devilish streak within <laughs> us, be able to explore that with um, Robbie Graham, who was our uh, director and choreographer. It was really fun, really cool. Yeah, it was liberating. And also that bled into Anne Juliet, the workshop. The okay. second workshop. So I was again doubling up, very yeah. grateful. Um, and I would like be at the American Church in Tottenham Court Road, worshiping at Juliet, and then I would run across town, hop fit into Hammersmith, and do a show. And that kind of fills you with adrenaline. It kind of not va not that you need validation, but as an actor, when you're working, you are validated. You feel content because you're ultimately doing what you love and what you always wanted to do. So. Uh, late 2018, early 2019 was also another one of those hotspots. Not quite as intense as 2016, but <laughs> still, still a vibe. Yeah, still a vibe. I saw uh, Tyrone Huntley in um, The View Upstairs. We love Ty. Uh, the View Upstairs. He was so he was so amazing. In, in he's the great. View, in, um, he's great in everything. Like, I will write him a role one day, and I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, that was, as a matter of fact, I was so so moved by the show, uh, The View, um, that I told a local theater about it, a friend of mine who's their artistic director, and they're producing it in their season, hopefully, uh, next year. So, uh, yeah, that's it's an amazing, amazing that's piece. Nice. All right, so you talked about Anne Juliet. Tell me a little bit about, was it a long rehearsal, a long um, audition process for you? How did you come connected to Anne Juliet? Um, I ultimately came connected through Luke Shepard, who's the director of In the Heights and also Anne Juliet. He called me in for a reading with Melanie LaBarry, um, at the end of 2017 and a bunch of other fantastic actors including one of my dear friends Evie Hoskins um and we read it out and no one knew anything about it, it was super oh, wow. it was like a page turn and I just was like wow because <laughs> oh, I've, I've grown up loving Max Martin and his music of course I think most people have even if they don't realize they have like he's incredible and he's shaped so many people the soundtrack to so many people's lives so I like I like bow down to him and I think he's a genius He's like the Holy Trinity, Timberland, the Neptunes, Max Mine, boom. Quincy's like, uh, Quincy's the universe, but they're like the Holy Trinity. And uh, yeah, so kind of read it and then didn't really think too much of it because they weren't sure if it was going to open in America or London. Oh, okay. But when I heard that they were exploring it for England, I was like, oh my God, it's it. Like, I gotta get back in, it was so good. <laughs> don't worry, it'll be fine. And then we did a workshop in 2018. And then we like like a development lab, and then we did another one in 2019. But in 2018, we did the workshop and kind of had a cast, and then we had to like formally audition, and that was that was cool. Like by that point, we I got to play and explore yeah, of who, course. They were, who they were, and who they were to the story. So I felt confident. It was just whether or not, depending on the direction that they wanted to take it, and ultimately with the chemistry 
with Francois and also the frame chemistry with Juliet and how yeah. May kind of interacts with the dynamic of the core four, I say. But for those that haven't seen, that's yeah. Juliet, her nurse, Anne Hathaway slash April and May. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it was, I really enjoyed it. I did really enjoy it, which is <laughs> rare. Usually an audition process is fine. Like it's a means to an end because you want to book the job. But anytime I got to kind of play and change my interpretation or have a, a think or a conversation about, about it, it was, it was liberating. It was nice. Yeah, I, I, I told so anybody that saw my Grace interview, I told this story, I'll tell it again. Uh, when I first, I, so I didn't know Max Martin by his name. Um, and when I first saw that Angelia was coming out, I was like, nah, not that interested, but I'll go see it because I know Grace and I'll check it out. Within like one minute, well, actually it had me when I walked in and saw the set, but then uh, uh, within within one minute, the show had me. I mean, the, the book is so smart. The music is you know, for those that don't know, Max Martin has literally written every pop song in the last like 15 years, uh, 20 years. Of, I mean, yeah. Oh and David West Reed, the book writer, is behind Shit's Creek. Amazing. Right? Yes. And, and yeah. the story is, the story is just so clever. I mean, just so absolutely clever. And uh, I, I, We've got Johnny I came... Bishop in. Sorry to interject. Johnny That's okay. You can interrupt me anytime. OGs. He was one of the OGs who did the Angelic workshop, but he's too busy, too busy at Books and Bless, so he's doing... He's currently waiting to start back in Bat Out of Hell as one of the leads, but he was doing Hamilton at the time. Which oh, Bat Out of Hell, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah that's, you know, fair. that's fair. What are you going to, yeah. So what is it, what was it like bringing this character, uh, would you, would you, would they identify as transgender? Is that a fair um, um, label, no, actually, I guess? They would be okay. gender fluid. Um, okay. Yeah, they would be gender fluid. I know some people say okay. non-binary. I actually, there's a difference for me, but... For me, as the actor playing May, May's, but we never actually say in the show. Yeah, no, exactly. So I don't want to. I don't want to open to, to interpretation. Yeah. So without labeling, I mean, the, the candid answer is May is a gender fluid character. Okay. But um, within the confines, most of the reviews, most of the people would say non-binary. But yeah, not trans, not trans. Okay. No. Okay. We love yeah. our trans. We love our trans sisters and brothers, but and our, and our trans so, family. So tell me a little bit of. Tell me a little bit about bringing. Yeah, I should know better about having a non-binary child. But uh, uh, no, tell me fine. a little bit. Of, <laughs> tell me a little bit about what it was like to bring that character to life, to workshop it, to figure out where this character was going from, like where it started from and where it ended up when it got on when they got on stage. Well, I think ultimately to, to link to your previous question, when I first read it, potentially May would have been more trans, but I think opening it up to explore the complexities of gender in a in a different way. Um, and not make a commentary through a trans lens because that would be taking away from the trans experience in some ways. They wanted to open up to a fluidity. I had a lot of conversations with the team about that and kind of exploring that and, and teaching LGBTQIA youth. I've done workshops with them for the past two, three years, which kind of actually started up around the time I read First Red and Juliet. So I would talk to them about it and this whole new generation. I mean, they're only, some of them are only 10 years younger than me, but mostly, they're mostly around 15, 16, but they're so open-minded and so yeah. liberal and just like chill about things. And a lot of them are agenda queer, a lot of them are gender fluid. And this has just been like Hornsey in London, which gives me, I would never have assumed that. I don't know why, but I'm put in my bubble of like, oh, theater, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually what's amazing is these, these kids aren't necessarily pursuing that, but they're just as artistic and creative and, and they want to explore and, make in different ways and that gives me a lot of hope so talking yeah. to them and kind of being like oh yeah well i might i'm intrigued by this character was really illuminating for me because i thought if they'll be able to see a version of themselves on stage that could speak volumes because they would often talk to me like one of them would say how they often love singing 17 and they would sing both parts because they're like, why can't I sing the girl and the boy part? And I was like, yes, <laughs> you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of um, be trusted with the role. But I think what's fantastic as well is that hopefully when then Juliet takes over the world and is in <laughs> Paris, Madrid, New York, Australia, they can allow different actors of different backgrounds to hopefully imbue their personal experience to illuminate May with a different energy. So, so they might potentially cast a trans actor and, sure. and, and May would become a trans role, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. It does. Absolutely. Because it's such a fluid um, piece and the team is so malleable, like they've really made it around a lot of the, the, the players within the show. Uh, yeah. I think that storyline was my favorite storyline in the, in the whole show. And you're, 
your solo um uh, not a not a girl not yet a woman uh tears streaming down my face when you uh when you sang that that was uh, uh amazing bless you well, i hope oh. it provides some simplicity and you know just what's important is i think when we opened in manchester a lot of people took them by surprise because it's so humorous up until that point and then it kind of was like oh how do we digest this and by the end yeah, of the song yeah. the, the power of max's lyrics like that song well he wrote it with dido which is not a lot of people know that but yeah Amazing. What's it like to sing that every night? Fantastic. Really <laughs> I grew up like Britney was the biggest pop star in the world. Yeah. And she, I mean, she's still iconic. I love her, but I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. But being able to sing it and find a new life to, to the words, a new layer is, it's really free. It's really yeah. free. It's, it's beautiful. I, think, I don't know if I'd have been ready to perform it. A few years ago but like like i said taking those risks that i didn't really think think i'd be doing like kinky boots where you have that bathroom scene in a, in a in and of itself um yeah kind of paved the way to that and then me writing even my own experiences down on paper oh wait yes who said that someone yeah. said the song really reminds me of not my father's song yeah i hear that absolutely yeah, yeah. um yeah it's just incredible it really is like even i can be in whatever mindset or something someone might have known me in the day but then i know that i have that to look forward to that's amazing what is your other what's your next favorite song in the show what else do you like to sing in, in the show what do i like to sing yeah yeah yeah. Mm, domino's quite good because it gets me warm because it's <laughs> video, so i'm like sing me down okay i'm warm now let's go show me love but um my favorite songs. Yeah, and I was gonna say, what, what's your favorite? What, what do you wish you could sing? I love F Imperfect that Mel sings. Is amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. I have to try and remind myself when I first, what, what was I like gassed up by? I love Baby One More Time in the rendition. Miriam Tiki is fantastic. Yes. Um, I don't know. I would pretend there's so many great songs. But yeah, probably <laughs> F Imperfect. I also wanted a duet with Shakespeare. I felt like he needed that moment when he was like talking to me about, oh, yeah. And then oh, just because just I selfishly want to sing with Ollie. But... I, I love that moment at the end of Act One. I wasn't expecting it, to be honest with you. And then uh, I probably should have been expecting it, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's such a great moment. <laughs> what was it like working with Max Martin? I don't have enough words, but the short answer is mine was blown pretty much because it was fun. It was amazing. Yeah, it was. He's the most humble, kind, talented person I've probably crossed paths with. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Grace told the story about how he would just, you know, because he's so visually unrecognizable. Like everybody knows, a lot of people know his name, more people know his song, but he would just pop out for a cup of coffee and she'd be like, wait, you can't go out there. There's people. <laughs> and he'd be like, no one knows me. I, no one recognizes me. It's like an amazing place to be. Uh, yeah, 100%. I want to like to wear Paloma Young's costume. She's one of my faves. I, I was a huge Great Comet fan, and uh, she uh, her costume designs are just spectacular. So, genius. Well, what, uh, yeah, ridiculous. They're also so comfortable. I can't. Are they? <laughs> I can't encourage more people to like. I mean, they can't do touch tours right now. But when you can book it for a touch tour, you need to come in and feel that jumpsuit, that bubble jumpsuit is so cozy. And yeah, I'm corseted, but it's like even made out of nice material as well. It's just, she's so fantastic. When I saw it was purple, I got so happy because I love purple. It's like royal, <laughs> and royal. Yeah, I think everyone, she went on everyone's pages, Instagram pages or social pages, and really got an essence of inher inherently who they are as a person. And then oh, wow. melded that with the show's vision and that kind of created the individual aesthetics for each player, each character. And she's amazing. I think I she- love, I love her. Uh, do everything and every show. <laughs> I, I love there's a hint of modern in it, but yeah, <laughs> throw back to the Shakespearean style as well. It's it's just, yeah. uh, and that yeah. fits the show, fits the show so well. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were fine. Um, I, yeah, yeah, just seeing the iterations as well and kind of trying on different versions of things and then seeing where we are now is amazing. We had a costume that was cut, which I wore in the very beginning, like May's first entrance. And it made me look like a quality street, which was also fantastic. But she was just like so willing to kind of roll with the punches and be like, no, it doesn't work, let's go move on. And I think that's amazing. That shows that she really like trusts her intuition, which is great because she's, she's so good at what she does.
Yeah, no, absolutely. There's no question. So one of the things we talked about it a little bit, but one of the things I really love about the show is, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of social messaging in there. Uh, not just the, the main and Francois story, there's powerful women stories in there, uh, things like that. I mean, what is it like bringing that but yet, it, but yet, I think it's relatable. Uh, I, I, I think I said this to Grace too. Sorry to keep referring back. But there's some people that aren't ready for all these messages. You know, some of us are. Some people aren't. But I think it, it presents a lot of these stories in a relatable way that you can sit there yeah. and maybe think and say, "Oh, okay, I'm seeing another side of things." So, what is it like bringing that story, whether it be the powerful women's story, your story? What is it like bringing that to an audience that maybe has not experienced a gender fluid story before, or you know, a powerful woman <laughs> story? What you said has kind of hit the nail on the head, though, because it's made it not that we should have. We're not that we're have ever having to censor. No, um, no, that's not what I mean at all. But, yeah. but it, no, you were right. Sorry, I'm not I'm contesting. I think it's great what you said because ultimately it makes it relatable and digestible, and secretly kind of not educates, but secretly unravels this fantastic world of these colorful, beautiful characters, and just shows like it is okay to be you. So we'd have sometimes sniggers or like, I think in Manchester, a couple walked out when oh. Francois kisses May. I didn't see it. I don't really ever look out of the audience until the bows. And even then I'm like, oh, I don't like this. But um, <laughs> I find it very uncomfortable. I'd rather just run up at the end of the show, in every show, but that's just me. Um, but yeah, someone told me at the end, they, they one of the front of house, I was like, oh, they left and kissed the girl when you guys kissed. And I was like, oh, jeez. I was like, well, you know what? They stayed that long, so <laughs> we got them. <laughs> For me, I'm such an advocate of visibility and representation. I cannot yeah. shout that even anywhere out of visibility, representation. Visi so if you're seeing a version of yourself where you're represented in some capacity, you're already pushing the boundaries. And this is what the show does so beautifully. And hopefully it doesn't do it in a preaching way, I don't feel. But it's just kind of offering up the truth and reality that as this spectrum of people this spectrum of characters exist in the real world so why shouldn't they exist in exactly. a made up world on stage i'm like hello exactly exactly especially in the shakespearean story i mean come on right i mean <laughs> right shakespeare loved sexuality and gender he would always yeah, play with that kind of represent that in interesting innovative ways so i'm like if we can't do it then now like come on so yeah, yeah absolutely um, so we're, 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 we're talking and talking and we only have an hour. So tell me a little bit about your writing. I want to hear a little bit about, uh, you wrote a play, you, you said you write a lot. Tell me a little bit about what you, what you're writing and what your stories tell. Ooh, um, my stories, well, I wrote a novel at 21. That was probably the first thing I wrote, which is just sitting, gathering dust. I will That's okay. Yeah. But that is like an urban fantasy adventure story. An American protagonist comes to London. I won't say too much more, but you know, okay. it's going to be a moment. But uh, what I'm writing at the moment, everything is, I guess, in some capacity, queer uh, and colorful, maybe. But, but I've written a musical that's in development. We actually did a read through on Zoom last week. That's a oh, amazing. And that was what I was writing when I was understudying at Angels. And then I did a reading 2017. I did a public reading 2018. And then yeah, I've been kind of in development with that. Then I'm also working with another thing that I can't say too much about just yet, but it's going to be really fun and really exciting. Um, yeah, and at the core, everything I write is about identity, whether that's race, which I mean it inherently is, is that I'm a black Asian man. Um, sexuality and gender. So they're like the pillars of everything I write. And then it permeates. So like one idea I'm writing very much is more about like race and sexuality. The musical is more about sexuality and gender. So, like, there's not even really, oh, there's a little bit. I mean, there's always going to be a bit about race, but yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, the musical is about two women, I'll say that. The other idea is uh, about a guy. Do you, uh, do you ever see yourself, you know, stopping performing to write or direct or do something off stage full time? No. Not yet. Not yet. Um, I think I want to perform for the rest of my life and then. Hopefully I'll be in a position where I can choose projects more appropriately, depending on what I'm doing elsewhere. Elsewhere, Like I have three brothers and two of them are directors. So I feel like oh, amazing. Them, I'd be encroaching on their territory and their space and they do it so fantastically that if I wanted someone who was an extension of me, I'd be like, yo, one of you direct this. Um, and then the other brother is also an actor writer. So we have each other to bounce our ideas upon, which is great. Um, so yeah, very lucky in that sense. What a, what a creative family. That's amazing. 
yeah, it's unusual. It is, but it's nice. Yeah. They're my support system, so I'm very grateful for that. That's yes. awesome. What um, what's a dream role for you? Well, uh, is there is there a role out there that is is a dream role for you? It's a great question, and I always think oh, I should really prepare an answer because I know it's going to come. Up. <laughs> I know it's a typical. But the the long and short of it is that. I didn't ever grow up wanting to play any roles. Like I never grew up saying I want to be Valjean or the Phantom. <laughs> um, and in terms of films, I'd love to play a spy. I'd love to play someone really physical, like Edward Scissorhands, whether that's on stage or in a film. Like it's someone where you can like it embodies because I'm a physical actor. Like, and I like using my body, so I think that would be cool to explore. But no, I don't know if there is a dream role, just a character that is not made, reduced to one characteristic, like not the yeah. sassy sidekick or not like the thug, you know what I mean? Someone who's yeah, no, absolutely. and flawed. So that would be a dream. And it's get, it's happening. It's happening slowly, slowly, slowly. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've made some amazing career choices so far. Uh, are you interested in TV and movie? Are you interested in doing more no. from that? No, no, you're a, no, you're a no, theater no. person. No. No, I love, love, love. Like, I um actually grew up always wanting to be a screen actor. Okay. I fell into theatre because of the rich theatre scene in London. And I felt out of my depth for the first few years. Like, oh, my God, I don't know anything about this. And, okay, sometime I know Merrily because they did that at my school, but what? And then I learned, and I constantly learned. David Badella, who's in my show, and I also did high school, has been a massive mentor in that way. He always educates and helps me. Um, and if I will question something, he's like, no, no baby no and they'll send me like the backstory and the situation in the moments and i'm like oh my god that makes so much sense <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to have people like that in my life who you know he came up with the likes of like billy porter and they've been massive um influences and i looked to them actually i'm very lucky to call them both men mentors and yeah it's cool to know that they paved the way so that i can inherently be myself like yeah yeah, that's, uh, that's so important these days, <laughs> especially with all the craziness going on. Um, I just had a question that flew out of my head. So, uh, oh, let's move on. Uh, we're going to get cut off. Instagram's going to shut us off in a minute. I feel bad asking these questions because we've been talking about a lot of important issues, but I'm going to do it anyway. So let's do it. You, re you ready for a little this or that round to, uh, sure. to finish it off? I ask everybody the same questions. So here we go. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Dog or cat? What up, Ryan? Uh, cat. <laughs> call or text? Cool. I knew you were going to be a call person. You're a call person. <laughs> I can tell that already. <laughs> Sweet or savory? Sweet. Cake or pie? Cake. Coke or Pepsi? Neither. Eh. Pepsi. I'll like <laughs> no, that's okay. You can. I'll. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, coffee or tea? Herbal tea. Mm. Uh, beer or wine? Wine. And Netflix or YouTube? YouTube. Only because it's like content created. I love Netflix. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But YouTube, you know, puts the user in the heart of it. If Netflix had a YouTube functionality, functionality maybe, yeah. then that would be a I don't know. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I just thought of my question. Uh, you know, what's your hope? Are you hoping to go back to Anne Juliet when this is all, uh, you know, are you hoping to resume playing May? Yeah, I mean, all... be, I can't wait for the show to be back and for everyone to see it because I feel like it was just starting its, its yeah. run. We were like four months in, so... Yeah, I was I was bringing my I was bringing I go to London a lot for work, but my wife doesn't get to go with me, and she was coming with me uh, in April, and I had Anne Juliet was the number one show I wanted to take her to see, so I can't wait to uh, to take her to see that. So uh, we are we are going to get shut off in fourteen seconds. So thank you, Aaron, so much. Thank uh, you.